Hey, dogs. How's it going? Is the rain going to stop? What do we think? All right. Thank you, President Kause, for that warm introduction. Thank you, incredible faculty, staff, administrators, for this amazing institution, for the wisdom and the scholarship that you infuse in all of these great students. And to the regents, the families, the friends, and especially to the class of 2016, it is truly an honor to be recognized by the University of Washington as your commencement speaker today. Because this school, this community, has given me so much over the years, like purple clothing, lots of purple clothing, like a paycheck. That's right. University paid me, are you ready, a whopping $1.98 an hour back in 1973 to serve burgers in the dorm cafeteria. We called them hockey pucks. I later upgraded for the same wage to rent out canoes at the canoe house long before it became the waterfront activity center. I got a husband. Believe it or not, Warren and I met here our freshman year. Our relationship started, as all good relationships should. The internet hadn't been invented yet. At a party on the third floor of Haggett Hall. Yeah. And yes, I got a world-class education. What I learned here at the UW has opened incredible doors for me in the 38 years since I sat in the same year chairs that you do now. And I know around campus there are actually exactly the same chairs that I sat in. And by education, I'm not talking about having learned how to prevent marine corrosion or how to un understand the nuances of the internal combustion engine, although that did come in handy when I put 15,000 miles on my Fiat back in 1977, my last chance to take a road trip before entering the real world. But more importantly, the UW taught me how to think, how to approach complex issues, how to speak up when something just didn't seem right, and how to find solutions. And it's those lessons that have been invaluable. The education that I received here and that you just received here, whether you're an undergraduate or a graduate student, will be foundational to anything that you do next. So, about that, what is next for you? I imagine that's a question you've been getting a lot lately. As it happens, it's a question I've been getting a lot lately, too. You see, it turns out there's this thing called the 22nd Amendment, which limits the president to two terms. So come January 20th, President Obama and I are out of jobs. So what's next? All right, here's how I answer that question. I have no idea. You're welcome to borrow that for yourself. It's sure to be a real winner with your parents. But I want to explain to you why I have no idea can be a perfectly great answer. And the first thing is to be open to new paths. If you were to look at my high school yearbook, Renton High School, class of 1973, I figured there'd be some Renton Indians out there. You find that I aspired to be a dental hygienist, a noble profession, one we all rely on. But that plan did not work out so well. Once I got to the UW, I found that Warren's engineering homework looked a lot more interesting than mine, and so I switched to mechanical engineering. A few MEs out there, too. During school, I landed a job working for General Electric, building components for the Alaska pipeline, solving little problems like, how do you insulate a pipe that expands when you put hot oil in it? After graduation, my degree took me to the oil fields of southern Oklahoma, where I tried to solve puzzles like, how do you increase production from an oil field that's been going since World War I? As you know, I didn't stay in the oil and gas business forever. Seattle called me home, the chance to raise a family near my family, the lure of the great outdoors close by, a feeling that the place 
was more important to us at that time than the career. So I accepted the first job offer I got at a bank. That's where I used my experience to help figure out whether certain loans to natural resources companies added up or whether they didn't. And it turns out a lot of them didn't, which has ended up being really good for my career. Because I learned quickly, it's always better to let other banks make loans that don't get paid back. My banking career, plus time spent in organizations like the Mountains to Sound Greenway Trust Board, making sure that I-90 didn't end up looking like I-5, with development that spanned every intersection across our beautiful Cascades, eventually led me to a job with REI, and eventually led me to a call from the President of the United States to serve in his cabinet. So I'm skipping a few steps in here, obviously. But my point is this. If I would have been dead set on my path from day one, dental hygiene or bust, I would have missed out on so many interesting careers, challenges, and experiences. And similarly, if I would have said in my high school yearbook that I want to be Secretary of the Interior one day, and by the way, I'd love it if any high schooler has ever said that, I would have missed out on the amazing zigs and zags of my career, and I'm quite sure I would not be at the podium speaking to you as Secretary of the Interior. So whether you got a job lined up starting next week, or whether you truly have no idea of what's next, I encourage you to be open to the zigs and zags of your own path. One of the great joys I get in this job is being out in our nation's public lands and meeting the people who are committed to so thoughtfully caring for them. Sometimes those visits can be really fun, like just yesterday when I was at Mount Rainier National Park with staff and we were treated to some of those peekaboo views of the mountain as the clouds came and went. But other times can be very difficult. Reassuring employees when their budgets are so tight they lack the resources to do their jobs. Or meeting with community members who disagree with how our public lands are being managed or dealing with an armed takeover of a wildlife refuge, as happened earlier in Oregon this year. The world is complex, and I learned very quickly that there are no no-brainers in this work. Everything is a brainer. But there's also huge rewards and opportunities to do some amazing things. Like when I was just a few months into this new gig and we were reviewing repairs for Superstorm Sandy to the Statue of Liberty, trying desperately to get her open for the 4th of July, I pointed up to Ladies Liberty, Lady Liberty's torch and asked, can we go up there? And the park ranger looked at me very seriously and said, ma'am, you can go anywhere you want. <laughs> so that was pretty neat as was a meeting just a few weeks ago with the nation's oldest Native American chief from the Blackfeet Nation in Montana, who gave me a new name. Sounds like there's some Montana and some Blackfeet out there. Congratulations. He gave me a new name, Far Away Woman, a name that might ring true with my husband, Warren, given the amount of travel I have in this job, but it was very meaningful to me. And I did get to spend a night in a submarine under the Arctic pack ice, but that's a whole different story. But I've learned that you need to do some of the fun stuff to make up for some of the really stressful stuff, and there's a fair amount of that to go around. Which brings me to my next piece of advice for you, which is help. Be part of the solution. This world, in all of its gloom and all of its glory, needs your help. There's no shortage of complex issues, the hairiest of hairballs that unfortunately won't be resolved by the time you get your diploma here in just a few minutes. But you can barely turn on the TV without seeing someone offering up short soundbite solutions to some of our most trying challenges. Highlighting controversy and challenging those with opposing views might boost ratings and help fill the 24-hour news airwaves but they won't solve the problems plaguing our planet. Every day, 
I have to juggle competing interests and consider the trade-offs. Take energy development, for example. As a nation, we've evolved tremendously in our production and our use of energy. From the days of unfettered pollution at any price to power our economy, to being smarter about how we develop in the right ways in the right places. To look at large landscapes more holistically because everything we do has impacts and trade-offs. Hydropower was and is critical to development of the Pacific Northwest and the entire West, frankly. But we now know better the impacts of development on salmon populations that once swam up these rivers and droves that were so important to the indigenous people of the region. We have a much better understanding, too, of the impacts of coal development on our streams and our atmosphere. We've seen what footprint oil and gas development can leave on landscapes and how devastating it can be to workers, wildlife, and local communities if there's an accident offshore, as happened in 2010 in the Gulf of Mexico. And even renewable energy, like wind and solar, has impacts. One senator I work with likes to call wind projects giant Cuisinarts in the sky for what can happen if a bird or a bat tries to fly through a wind farm. And migrating waterfowl can mistake large solar arrays in the desert for lakes landing and being unable to take off. So nothing is simple. Nothing is free. And yet we need energy to fuel the cars, the light rail, the buses that brought you here today, to turn on the stadium lights at Husky Games, to power that smartphone that we rely on, whether it's to consult the ubiquitous Wikipedia, although none of you would have used that in your research as a tool, of course, to snap a selfie as you walk across this stage, or to Snapchat with our friends, like a few of you might be doing right this minute. How we power our world essential to lifting people around the world out of poverty while reducing our consumption and ensuring we're doing everything we can to stop climate change is one of the most pressing issues of our day. Recognizing that our decisions also have impacts on the lives and livelihoods of people has to be taken into account. So this won't be solved on my watch. I got seven months and a few days to go, although we've made great progress nor will it be solved by oversimplifying the situation or thinking it can be resolved overnight with the flip of a switch as we replace one resource with another. It's not that easy. And with the education you've been blessed to receive at the UW comes the great responsibility of challenging those who believe the world is as simple as yes or no, black or white. It's going to continue to take the best and brightest minds to develop safer, cleaner, and less impactful ways to power our world while appreciating the importance of the ecological, cultural, and spiritual benefits we get from our lands and waters. And it's going to take nurturing future generations to appreciate nature, exposing them to the world's best classroom, the one with no walls. We need you the best and brightest minds in law, in public service, in education, in science, in medicine, in business, in art, in communications, in understanding the human dimension to tackle this and many other big issues like income inequality, like unsustainable development, or illegal trafficking from drugs to humans to endangered wildlife, and the global spread of disease, to name just a few. It's easy to stand on the sidelines and shout suggestions, but we will solve more when we come together and work for the common good, for the commons. I spent four decades in the private sector, but the last three and a half years in public service have been the most rewarding of my life. And I encourage you to consider a career of the same. The only office I ever ran for was to serve as the student body secretary in my high school. I won by a landslide, but I certainly never thought that I would serve as secretary in the president's cabinet. But I've found there's no greater calling than public service, and the world needs you, now more than ever before. So my last piece of advice is to stay balanced. 
A mentor of mine, diehard Husky, former regent, now in his 90s, Jim Ellis, once told me that he endeavored to divide his life into thirds. A third for home, a third for work, and a third for community. I continue to strive to follow his advice. There have been points in my life when it's been hard to find and keep this balance. Times in work has taken me away from home for long stretches, or when I haven't been able to give back to my community in the way that I want to. So in that spirit, I do have some idea of what I'm doing next, and it has to redo, do with uh, regaining some of that balance. Come January, Warren and I are gonna jump into our Prius and take a long, slow road trip back from Washington, D.C. to the best Washington, Washington State, during which we plan to spend some quality time visiting our nation's public treasures. We want to satisfy Warren's flying bug and check out the Wright Brothers National Memorial and Tuskegee Airmen National Historic Park. Maybe see the Sandhill Cranes migrate at Bosque del Apache National Wildlife Refuge in New Mexico. Explore the narrow slot canyons on public lands in Utah and Arizona. And spend time in Indian country, appreciating our nation's rich indigenous culture. So whether you agree with the exact rule of thirds, or whether you find your own particular magic balance, I encourage you to understand what makes you tick, and then strive, strive, strive to infuse that meaning into your life at all times. You grew up in a world that is hyper-connected and always on. So put down your tablets for a while, not forever, and pick up a hobby. Volunteer, be a mentor, take a hike. If you're blessed to still have your parents, Call your father, call your mother, actually always call your mother. <laughs> Whatever it is you do, I imagine you'll find it's the activities and the relationships that you make outside of work that truly make your life three-dimensional. And along the way, don't forget to take care of yourself. Exercise, drink water, Make time for nature, walk in the rain, and don't let time pass you by without having fulfilled some of your greatest desires. Travel while you're young and able, for you'll never regret what you did, but one day you might look back and regret what you didn't do. You are the best and brightest. You are. You're all important parts of the solution. And I am very optimistic as I look out into this audience about our future. So I'm gonna go close by making a few amendments to my suggested answer I gave earlier on the what are you doing next question. I have no idea, still a great answer, as long as it's followed up with, but I'm going to be open to new paths, I'm gonna be part of the solution, and I'm gonna infuse my path with meaning and balance. Pretty simple, right? Congratulations on your, your graduation. It is great to be a Husky. Good luck to each and every one of you. Thank you, and go dogs.